Today, our spotlight shines brightly on the remarkable Abby Munro, a mixed media artist whose work resonates deeply with her profound connection to the world around her. Abby's creative journey is truly awe-inspiring. As both an artist and creative mentor, Abby has charted a distinctive course, weaving together artistry, nature, and spiritual awareness. Her creative canvas goes beyond the ordinary, Abby shares with us that as artists, we are constantly seeking ways to enhance our creative practice, seeking depth and authenticity in our work. And in doing so, we often turn to various sources of guidance and inspiration. One such source, often overlooked but deeply connected to the natural rhythms of life, is the moon's cyclical phases. This fusion adds a layer of significance that reaches right into the heart's core and it mirrors her profound spiritual connection to the universe. Leaving no stone unturned for her quest in creativity, Abby studied fine art at the University of the Creative Arts and delved deeper into textiles, completing an MA at the Chelsea College of Art. Abby's art journaling adventure began 25 years ago and it has guided her into the enigmatic territories of self-discovery where her inner artist found its voice. Yet her creative voyage does not stop at personal expression. It extends into the very landscape that envelops her. Situated along the Suffolk coast, she gathers materials such as photos, sketches, sounds and videos for inspiration where she adeptly weaves stories together using thread and stitches to create beautiful works. In Abby's world, her finds transform into relics revealing hidden narratives. Materials like organic debris, vintage textiles and thread symbolize the passage of time and accumulation of memory. Her studio practice embraces her midlife experiences where she skillfully captures life's rhythms, energy and harmony, adding a distinctive layer to her work. Her creations resonate deeply, connecting with the essence of human experience. We explore her contemplations, often echoing feminine portrayals and using Mother Nature as a metaphor for life's ebb and flow. Today, we invite you into our studio for an enlightening conversation with Abby Munro. Together, we will embark on a journey where art, nature, and spirituality intertwine in a truly captivating manner. As our 109th Friday feature artist, please help me in welcoming Abby Munro into the studio by leaving a comment below and letting us know where you are in the world. Hello, Abby. How are you doing? Hi, Deborah. Go. That was that was pretty overwhelming. That was I I've never heard yeah, I've haven't had anyone speak about my work like that. So thank you so much. Well, that was came from my heart. It, it was really beautiful work. And I'm so, so it's such a pleasure to have you here. And when Anne said, Would you like to take this interview? Of course I said yes. <laughs> We've got so many. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. And welcome. We've got so many wonderful people tuning in, Abby. I thought we could show some of the names. I think you maybe recognize a few friends. Yeah. Welcome, hi. Vivian from Bath, um, Norfolk. There we go. First timer. There's so many wonderful people. We've got, oh, we've got some fat students here, which is wonderful. Hello, Eva. Alison Lee Coulson. Hello, Ali. This is wonderful. From Israel. Wow. This is wonderful. Look at all these beautiful people. Hannah Loney, the fabulous Lorna Crane. This is oh, just wonderful. Wow, big inspiration. <laughs> oh, really? That's lovely to hear. <laughs> there's so many wonderful people. Wow, there's some. We've got Sweden, we've got Ireland, New Zealand. Just wonderful, Abby. Oh, wow. And South Africa. Hello, Robin. How are you going today? <laughs> That's wonderful. And we've got lots of people tuning in from the UK, Abby. So lots. it's going to be a great session, I'm sure. 
So, Abby, how are you feeling? I thought we could start off by uh, introducing who you are, share a little bit about your journey as an, as a, your early journey as an artist, um, and just give us give us a little bit of a background um, and your and a little bit of insight into your path. Yeah. So this is a it's an interesting question because I feel like I've um, I'm stepping into a new identity, but it's an old identity. So I moved to the Suffolk coast. Uh, nearly three years ago now and just before the pandemic and being at home trying to sell a house um, I had to find some sort of solace so I was like who who do I want to be when I move to this new place and I made this decision to even though I'd graduated in art to be a fine artist and just to step into that identity every day and wake up being that person and um even though I graduated like 25 years ago it feels like this journey has only really just begun yeah. which is now really exciting and I think that's to do with um going through perimenopause and this whole like liminal space that I feel I've been in and there's a there's a whole new journey in front of me which is really exciting yeah. And um, I was going to ask you what inspired you to embrace a simpler way of life and become so deeply engaged with nature. Is it something that was always inherent in, inherent in you or was it just? Yeah, of... I, yeah, I grew up in a village and I always liked sort of quiet. Um, I liked the analog way of life and I was brought up learning how to cook and bake and stitch and make it was basically homemade everything was homemade and handmade so yeah that was always something that I loved but there was a definitely a, a push-pull in my 20s of wanting to go to London and live in London and which I did for a while I lived in South London um, but there was always there was always something in my gut that didn't feel right I always felt like an outsider right yeah. And your move to Suffolk, you said, was three years ago? Mm hmm Right. Um, Abby, I took a slideshow, uh, a slide snippet off your website uh, when I was, uh, I'd like to just show this for a second. Um, uh, when I sent it to you, uh, asking if we could explore this a bit more, I loved your response. You said to me, oh, yes, this is my creative manifesto. I make them to keep me rooted to my truth. And it really helps me when I'm feeling a little bit lost at sea. Mm. So that was beautiful, Abby. Um, and I, I really read the boxes very carefully. Do you, would you tell, tell us a little bit more about that? There's, that's obviously a mantra of yours. Yeah, so I've done a lot of work trying to find out, because we think about what we're going to put in our art, what symbols, what um, objects, you know, am I painting a landscape? Am I doing still lives? You know, what what is the subject matter? But I always got, confused with this because there was so much and a lot of lot more depth to it so I did loads and loads and loads of mind maps writing words phrases things that I've been researching and just then I put them into a computer put them in alphabetical order then I could see like if any were repeating each other then I printed them all out and it so that would sort of evolved within like my journals over a few years and then they're the core things that have come out that really stand out and are maybe like the umbrella terms for things that I'm I want to explore in my practice does that make sense absolutely absolutely yeah that's yeah thank you that's great and this was the other slide that I pulled up which I thought was really beautiful um and I found these words so very powerful my artistic exploration took me to the edges to, to, took you to the wild edges of yourself. Could you delve deeper into what those liminal spaces mean to you and perhaps tell us a little bit more about this chapter in your life? I love this. This is where I met my artist. Yeah, I think I felt like I was in, I was in no man's land and I didn't really, I didn't know what direction to take. Um, but then that's when I think I really slowed down and really just connected with the seasons and with nature and started to think about those liminal spaces and how we can if we spend time in them 
we can start to see our truth and what really resonates with us and those like innermost desires. And I did lots of work on figuring out what it was that brought me joy, that what really made me happy. And I went back to when was I most happiest in my life? And I had, I did a lot of visualizations um, and my happiest time that came to me was this young 19 year old going off to art college with all her materials and supplies and just like these endless possibilities. And I re tried to keep revisiting that girl and listening, started to listen to the music she used to listen to, the books she was reading, the way she used to dress and just sort of, it was, um, there's a poem as well. I can't remember the author calling back that girl. And it was like, yeah, reconnecting with my, with my maiden who was like before, yeah, before before life's obstacles got in the way it was like that whole when you've got all that space in front of you yeah and meeting her again was just yeah just so so powerful for me and then yeah so they the, there was a lot of pain as well to go through on those wild edges um but then it brought me back onto I don't feel like I'm on a direct path and I'm quite happy now. I'm actually really enjoying being in those liminal spaces because there is that freedom again that there was before, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then, Abby, whilst you were going through that uh, uh, journey of, of exploration, uh, your, your colours on your Instagram page are so beautiful. They, they're bleached white. They're really soft, subtle tones. I'm really curious to know if... You have you always loved those colours, or is that something that has evolved over time? Was there a much younger Abby that was wild and crazy in terms of her colours, or have you always? Yes. yes? Yeah. <laughs> um, like some of my friends and family call me Mrs. Beige, <laughs> which I don't really like <laughs> because it's not beige. <laughs> There's lots of colours, and when you when you remove colour you remove choice and mm. when you look at tones for me it gives me um a space to think so colors even if there's one thing that's a color in my studio it will distract me i'm not sure what that is but my work was um very monochrome when i was at um, on my foundation course and I remember my tutor saying you need to explore colour and I did and it was a disaster and I remember taking into an interview and yeah they were absolutely ripped to pieces <laughs> um, but then I explored um, all of these earthy colours I was drawing like all the negative spaces between branches and doing these big paintings with, and bringing neons in so it was like when you're out on a walk and you see um, sort of tape, plastic tape that's been put up to, to corner off a section or like a warning sign. or when, So when you've got these man-made things planted into nature, that you get this like pop of colour. So yes. I was exploring it in that way. And that's something that I'm still interested in. And then on my textiles um, MA, my work was... It was lots of colour, but very muted. I was referencing um, vintage pieces of fabric, so fabric from the, the 40s and 50s, um, which they were printed on wool, so the wool gave it this, this subtlety and muteness, even though they were very deep, rich colours. Um, but also in conjunction with that there was a lot of white so I was casting concrete I started casting porcelain then um so there was there's always been this like this play and I do now explore color in my art journals which is a really you know to cut it out completely if I say I'm I love my garden and I grow as much as I can and if those colors call to me then yeah I'll jump in my art journal and explore those colors but in terms of my, I mean, there is colour in my work, but it's not, um, 
it's, 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 not, not, it's not glaringly obvious. It's subtly there, which is so beautiful. I've, it's so so, yes. so, and it's so sophisticated. I think it's, um, I was thinking about my season, like what's my season? That's you know, finding your style. And my season is that time that we're coming into now, that end of summer into autumn when everything's bleached and starting to dry out and like seed heads and but they've got their strength and they've had their time to bloom but now they're standing there strong waiting is like architectural forms and um, you've actually that season you've got a really beautiful photograph here which i'll show everybody this mm. just is absolutely beautiful i feel like that's exactly what you're talking about right yeah. now yeah 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 really because you start to see their architectural form rather than when everything's green um it sort of blends into one but yeah. then they sort of come into their own as they dry out oh yeah i'm a, i'm crazy about seed heads i just have them everywhere <laughs> that's lovely amy thank you for sharing that with us um i feel like i really would like to move into talking about abby's den and your studio uh, i've taken some sl slides uh, from your this is just glorious please tell us about this little adventure that you're on with and the name of this beautiful contraption <laughs> So this is Wilbur, <laughs> and she is a 1964 Alpine Sprite. And I was walking, it was after just after we moved here, I was walking across the fields and I'm, I'm in my spare room, which is a very small room. And I used to have a garden studio and I just missed that connection with the garden. And our garden is um, long and lumpy and wild rabbits um, love it. Yes, but it makes it very unstable for anything. So I just thought, what? Where can I be? Where do I see myself at the bottom of the garden? And I just thought, oh, vintage caravan. Went on eBay, and the first one that popped up was was Wilbur. She was in a bit of a state when I bought her with loads of flaking paint. So the plan was to turn her into a studio, and then last year the wasps moved yes. in. Yes. Yeah, they care the wasps. I just left them to create this glorious, glorious nest. So they took occupancy last summer. So I've only just gone in there again and I've now stripped it back to the slide you showed. So she's back to her her metal and yeah, she's gonna be re insulated so that I can spend autumn and winter down there as well, which would be nice. Beautiful. She's lovely. I can't wait to see when she's done. She's really yeah. beautiful. And then, Abby, your studio, of course, I'm sure many people are right now, whilst listening to you talking, are having a good scout around your beautiful studio. Uh, I wish mine was this tidy. It definitely is not. I have too many colours, so I can empathise with what you're saying. It's really beautiful. I just Yeah, I think uh, it's because it's so small as well. It's like I just need – and I've got so much in here too um, – and I do have to, um, so on the new moon, I have a big, a big tidy up and refresh all the space and bring some energy into it. Um, and then every week I try and have a clear down because if I'm working on one project, I have to work on it and then um, put stuff away because I can't have too many things out. I'd like, because I used to have a huge, huge studio in a warehouse in south london and i just think God, if only i had that now but then i think you're not as focused when you have a big space and over the years my studios have got smaller and smaller and smaller but then actually at art college you only have a desk so so abby I must, are you, are you, do you find that you're very meticulous in the way you file things i feel like when i look at this image here everything has a place and a space and it's labeled and marked yeah because otherwise i forget where things are so I have to put labels on everything because I have this um, this habit of refreshing the space and then putting things away and then not remembering their new place that I thought was amazing for them. So I try and I have a Dymo labeler that I label everything and then I do my labels and all my drawers so that I know where things are. Yeah, beautiful. Um, Abby, let's, uh, I'd like to talk about some of your work. Um, you've You've given a really beautiful quote on your website. Um, My current work was born out of a re-evaluation of how we live our lives 
and how we heal and how we grow, embracing a simpler way of life, engaging with and supporting nature. Your art resonates uh, with a deep spiritual connection to nature. I just, it's so beautiful. Can I, um, I'd like to share some of the images and maybe you can talk us through some of them and the meanings behind them. This one, I'll start with this one. Yeah, so this is, um, this was really inspired by a sea shanty and um, an episode, it was an episode of um, Wurzel Gummidge, which is a thing in the UK that this, um, this writer has done this, new, it was a programme in the 1970s, I don't know whether you had that, what, you know Wurzel Gummidge? So he's no. a scarecrow who lives in a field. Right. Um, but he comes to life. So children, he only speaks to children. So right. there was an episode where he went to the coast and there was um, a lady who lived in this shack on the coast, but she was knitting um, the, all the nets for the fishermen. And there was a, she was singing this sea shanty and it was just the most magical thing, but they could hear the call of the... Um, the ship out at sea that was a shipwreck so where I live there's a whole town that's under the sea that was lost and the um the coastline eroding so it was just all about all these different there's all these different stories um and beings that are just here on this coastline that I just feel really drawn to so Abby every work you create uh, you deeply connect with uh, through, whether it's through your process or in, in the actual creation of it. Um, if, am I, what I'm trying to ask you is, does every piece you make have a very deep meaning to, to what you're doing? Yeah, they all, um, they have a story or I start with a poem. So it might be, or it might be a title. So then the title starts and then, so they all come out of my art journals. So the, there would be bits and pieces that are started in my art journals that I can then, they sort of weave themselves together over time and then it might just be one title that comes out that then pulls it all together or it might be a poem or I do a lot of concrete poetry. I think um, there was an image at the, the beginning where I take words and cut them up and then reorder them. Okay. So yeah. that then you create a new a new poem from those words and then something out of that might pull itself pull itself in um yeah that's a page from my from my art journal so then something might trigger later on it's never immediate it's always um a few weeks or months and actually there's some pieces that have come together like years later that have just mm -hmm. been they've been hovering about sort of in a juxtaposition i put things in boxes together objects in boxes um and then there might be that final piece that then pulls it together. That's incredible. So every piece is so considered, which I think is really, really beautiful. And then, of course, you, you are incorporating natural uh, found items, which, um, again, emphasizes your spiritual connection to the earth and to nature. It's just beautiful. Yeah, so that flower was actually pressed by my grandmother in the 70s. So I had all her flower presses and then she wrote on the blotting paper, like the date. So I've tried to, I've made a few, like, cause she used to do these beautiful pressed flower pictures, but then there's bits that have fallen off. But then um, when I inherited books of hers, I found a flower pressed in this one and a couple of flowers oh pressed goodness. in that one. That's so beautiful. And then she always had her linens, um, pressed so she had a drawer of all her perfect linens all her um tray cloths everything was ironed and starched beautifully so there's a few little bits there of like edges of them that's lovely I, I believe we called those the bottom drawer am I right it was called the bottom drawer back in the day where all the yes. linens went yes this is beautiful as well this one yeah so that is actually out of the bottom drawer the dress so that's a baby's dress um because yeah, there was lots of things just beautifully pressed, wrapped in tissue and squirreled away. So delicate. 
Abby, surely you must struggle to part with them then. I, I haven't, none of them have been parted with. I haven't, um, I've never sold my works ever, like even mm -hmm. through art college. Um, I used to do a lot of installation work. Um, I've sold prints and then I've sold um, other additions, but I haven't sold original works before. And that's, that's a choice? Is that a choice? Yes. Yeah, yeah. That's beautiful. But there might be an addition that comes out of a piece of work. Yeah. But the actual pieces, um, I feel I need as part of my archive to understand my journey and where I'm going. I don't produce a lot, a lot of work. So, um, I mean, that might change. That might change in the future. But that's where I am at the moment. Um, when, we, when we were having a chat earlier, you mentioned to me that you made an executive decision to turn up and be an artist as opposed to not being one. Um, so I find, it, I find it really intriguing that you've made that decision and yet you're still you're choosing not to sell your work. I think that's incredible. It's empowering. It must be very empowering. Um, I wasn't – at art college, we were never taught – it was, like, never part of our – education to be commercial artists um and even on my ma at, of doing textile design um you were made it was it was more of a you were making samples that would then inspire something else and i was um i did launch a fabric collection printed fabric collection um and i launched pro uh, ceramic products as well um I don't know, I just never see myself as a commercial artist. But yeah. then maybe, yeah, I do feel that something will, something is emerging at the moment, some sort of an, um, set of additions or because I do so much photography as well and I do the photo montages, that they will then evolve into something that I would sell. So, Abby, that's uh, interesting that you bring up the photographs. Um, would be a good, uh, I mean, I would love to show, I've got some of your beautiful images here. You mentioned you use a vintage camera, which we'd love to have a little look at. Um, I don't see you using the actual photographs in your work. Or am I, 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 am I right? I don't, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, would... yeah, so the, the house is a photograph. Right. And in the sea shanty one, um, there was, photographs as well okay so I I paint onto the, yeah there's a photograph underneath underneath right. all that so I use photo um transfer medium and transfer them onto to fabric or onto the surface of the canvas or I use the actual photo and then that's montaged on so your work has many many layers in Abby I can yeah. see that from your images yeah I'll just show some more images for the, this is a lovely one here. I think this is so beautiful. And then I, I've got a close up of it showing the detail of the, I'm assuming that's porcelain. Uh, yeah, I think it's porcelain. I think there's porcelain, plaster, and maybe some wax. On that oh, one. Lovely. Yeah, lovely. And the, um, the image on that one was my photographs, but then um, photocopied to do jelly prints from. Oh, yes. Yep. Yeah. Wonderful. So many layers and many processes go into one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I would imagine that since you mentioned that you sometimes have a piece that you still keeping on adding to years later, there would be many layers on those. <laughs> um, yeah, it's more like so there'd be that piece of fabric that then I've dipped in porcelain and then a bit of that might match will be brought together with that photograph and then that will be cut out. So I suppose there's lots and lots of um, of sampling. Yes. And then there's, there's a lot of works in progress as well that are just waiting for that, that foraged find to add to or that bit of Moment. something. Yeah, mm. yeah. And Abby, so do you ever rip and repair and tear up and you yeah. do? all the time yeah 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 yeah, yeah. do you yeah, find like, that empowering 
Um, yes, because it, I found it, um, I think I've got this story in my head and this narrative, and I used to be called Scissor Happy because I used to cut up everything, <laughs> including clothes, and I still do that. So it's like, I don't like that garment. I want to turn it into something else. And I think because I taught fashion and textiles for years as well. So it's that whole um, I remember doing a project that I loved and we were turning a jacket into a, a skirt and a shirt into a, um, a dress. So that whole rearranging, I suppose it's um, a form of collage as well. Yeah, it absolutely is. Yeah. But then you've got this narrative like that. That's a bad thing to be scissor happy and to not cut things up. So I try and embrace it I love tearing that's one of my favorite things there's nothing better than the sound of something tearing isn't it and you don't know where it's going to tear either and then what edge you're going to be left with and mm, yeah so there's there's lots of boxes and baskets of of torn bits and pieces of paper and fabric <laughs> that's lovely I can't wait so we, Angie and I will come and visit you so we can have a look at all those boxes <laughs> I think <laughs> Um, Abby, I'd love to uh, show some of our viewers um, some of your sketchbooks that you you may have on hand, um, because you mentioned you know you started art journaling 25 years ago. So in my mind, that's telling me you've probably got 25 years worth of sketchbooks. No, no, no. So I did lots of sketchbooks at college. Um, I still have one. A few of them were kept by my college, um, and then I didn't go in a sketchbook for decades right. I bought sketchbooks they sat on my shelf hence the fear of the blank page which we will talk they sat about on my shelf empty and again it was this sort of visualization that I wanted this shelf full of sketchbooks bursting at the seams with sticky pages and bits falling out of them and then it was again making that decision that I was just going to jump in and then I remembered something that we um a friend of mine at art college that we used to do with our sketchbooks and we had to create a lot of sketchbooks back then so we'd do grounds so you'd get a whole sketchbook and fill the whole thing with grounds in like right. a day so that you didn't have you didn't have a blank page that you had something to go back onto and that's something that I I do now in some of them and it's just it's really freeing because you've already got something to yeah. to work with, and when you're in flow doing that, um, you're not you're not thinking about the end result because you know that it's just a surface that you're creating. Yes, yeah, and you're reusing, which is great, isn't it? Yeah. Um, Abby, you've given me some wonderful photographs of some close-up images of your process. Um, I'd love to share them with our viewers so you can have we can have a little talk through some of your, some of your wonderful layers that you have. This is just beautiful. Yeah, see, I have to remind myself. <laughs> um, yeah, this is like I've got all these. I bought a huge lot of of different threads. Um, and I think there's like waxed ones and they weren't um, haberdashery ones. So they're quite coarse. But then I've got lots of button threads as well. I've got that lovely thick texture. So they're all they're all vintage and they're all natural materials. But I've been I think on that piece, I've been exploring a lot with tracing paper. Yes. Um, yeah. So the tracing paper and then soaking it in coffee and tea. Oh, beautiful. And then screwing it up and ironing it. So it just, I love changing the the surface of something and just playing with the materials to see if you can get different textures and turning paper, taking a piece of paper and then making it have that that movement of fabric. Yep. This is also beautiful. This one, I love, I, I love the, it, to me, this bottom corner looks like it's um, acrylic paint that's dried and you've peeled it off. That is a, a piece of paint off my garden table. Oh, lovely. That you've actually it, chipped off. Well, it, yeah, when it flakes off. So if there's anything, if anything like that happens, I just keep it all in boxes. So I've got like little packets of flaked paint or chips off something or little bits and pieces of different surfaces. Oh, I've got old bits of wallpaper when we scrape wallpaper off. Oh, lovely. Yeah. 
This is also beautiful, Abby. Um, you obviously have a sewing machine, um, yeah. but you do a lot of hand stitch as well. Yeah, I think I was thinking about this um, because I was on my sewing machine yesterday, and I feel that in the spring and summer, my energy doesn't um, doesn't work with hand stitching. I can't sit. I can't sit still in the spring and summer. But when we get into late autumn and winter, they're the times that I really want to sit with my hand stitching. So I can see in my studio and I've been looking through that there's pieces that I started last last winter. And as soon as that spring energy's come in, they've been abandoned. And I like the, an, the immediacy of, of using the sewing machine. Oh, but then nice. I know that I can revisit those and I feel like a basket so that I have that um, to work with in the evenings and early mornings right is, so is your studio attached to your home was it separate yes, so the, yeah I'm yeah I'm in a in the spare room okay yeah but you'll move into Wilbur when Wilbur's ready um I'll just have that as a a space that I can use and my husband's an artist as well so he can use that space too and we can bird watch down there so it will be I think it will just be quite empty but a space that you can go down and have an analog day because there's no electricity and there won't be any wi-fi or so it'll be a nice escape sounds wonderful i must say and um, this is the last image that i had up abby the reason why i asked you about the stitching is because that looks like that's quite a lot of hand stitching in there and then it looks wow. like you've coated the whole thing so that's actually pencil okay and they're all drawn stitches and I've been exploring this a lot, actually, because when I did my printed textile collection, they were all drawings of doilies. So I'd drawn the doilies and then printed the doilies onto linen. But people thought it was black work because of the density of the ink. So then that's what I've been playing with. So this sort of trompe l'oeil of like, is it stitch or is it drawing or and I just find that when you've got all these different layers I wanted to stitch the whole thing but it's wood mm -hmm. so it's like well how do I how do I assimilate these yep. stitches and yeah trying well, out lots worked. of different pencils <laughs> it worked yeah. it worked uh, yeah I've got I'll show you in here I'll just so see these, oh, that's okay. just all falling out because so these pages, they're just watercolours that then I've been going back into and playing with with lines. Beautiful. And, and then will you come back and rework them and rework them and rework them? Is that the intention? Um, no, I think I have different sketchbooks for different things. So I think this this one will just stay stay like that. So if I've got like off cuts which have just all fallen out. So when I've got offcuts of watercolours, yes. that sketchbook will just be a place for that. So it might be somewhere that I visit for five minutes in the morning or when I want a break from the computer, and then that will just evolve. And then, yeah, it might be a page that I revisit, and then that will I'll bring that into a piece of work. Yeah, that's lovely, Abby. Um, I'll let you have a drink of water. How are you going? Good. It's very holistic, I think, <laughs> the way that I work. There's no um I let things I let things sort of speak to me rather than trying to dictate. That's helped me a lot. Um I used to jump to the final piece a lot when I was younger and I think working with design for so many years as well, it's always the end piece in mind. Absolutely. Yeah. That's so true. It's always about the brief and what the end result is. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So it's yeah. Where where is this? Where's this process going to take me? And just letting it evolve. Yeah. And also knowing that you can tear it up, yes. paint over, it, cut it up, rip it. Completely, yeah, rip it. Cover the whole thing. Start again. Like stick a page, whole page on top of it. It's like yeah. There's always this this play. Yeah, it's lovely. Um, Abby, can we talk about your vintage camera and can we show the viewers? Have you got it there with you to give us a little? Yeah, so um, 
it's a it's a vintage lens that I then use on a digital SLR. Right. Okay. So you can buy, um, if people don't know, you can buy adapters that go on digital SLRs for then certain lenses that you can put on. But the the main thing about this lens is it's got a really low f stop, so I get loads of depth of field filled with it, and there's a real softness to it as well with a a vintage lens. I mean, some of the lenses that I use as well. I've got hairs in them or bits of dirt, but that's all part that's all part of, part of it, which is which is it gives it a softness. So Abby, were these images that I'm showing up now, were those taken with that camera? With your yeah, camera? So that one is because yeah, you get that real wispy, wispy look mm. um, behind. That one as well. This one's exquisite, this. So that was actually taken on my iPhone on a bus. Right. And it was the depths of winter. And, yeah, it was just fast. And I just did snap, snap, snap. And then it's not until you sort of get home. I just saw this landscape I was going past on the bus, which was just beautiful because it was just this bareness and the structure of the trees. And then that's been worked on, on Photoshop, bringing in other other elements and layers and softening the tones beautiful abby um abby i thought um we could touch on um on you, you mentioned how you went through a phase of grief and um it knocked you totally off your course um but you 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 said in you've quoted on your website how um creativity transported you back and showed you the way could mm -hmm. we and you, you also mentioned to me when I spoke to you in our uh, pre-interview that you are an open book and you do wear your heart on your sleeve. So uh, we, I'd really appreciate it if we could have a little conversation about what that was and how, how you came out of it and where it's taken you from there. Yeah, so um, I, lost, um, I lost my grandma, I lost my mum, I lost my dad, I lost um, my journey with fertility and all within five years. And when the first, when I was first faced with grief, I didn't know what to do with myself. And I was just, I needed something to escape, escape from that pain. And it was textiles and stitch that got me past that. So I just, I went and did, a friend of mine used to teach courses like day, day retreats and I made dolls and I made clothes and then I I think I watched um I think it was a YouTube video Japanese a Japanese girl filling a filling a sketchbook with just collage pieces but to the most beautiful music and it was only about five or six minutes long but I just put it on repeat and just sat with my sketchbooks. And then that's sort of where the, where the art journaling, the art journaling began because there was this flow. I felt like I was healing. And then um, when I lost my mum, I had that to jump straight into as like this, it was like a sort of a hug and it sort of supported me. And then any time that I felt um, that I want to think about something or spend time just thinking about that loss or remembering that person, then my art journal is that vehicle because I can bring together photos or elements or using my grandma's pressed flowers, um, little bits and, of their clothing that I've like taking bits of ribbon because they both had sewing boxes that had every, everything in for every occasion like all those little edges of pieces that you just oh that snipped off we pop that in the in the sewing box so all of those things um I can work with and use and it just brings me it just brings me closer to them again I can totally understand that Abby it makes me understand your work completely now I wasn't prepared for that at all, but I now understand 
why you keep everything and you have no desire whatsoever to sell anything because every piece you're creating is is a is like a shrine of a memory of them that's so beautiful yeah I think it's um it's somewhere I want to go and visit it's an escapism um and the work that perhaps will be um more commercial that perhaps will be sold will emerge out of these pieces but at the moment this body well there's a few bodies of work that I've been creating since I moved here um I think that they're sort of the roots and then I've got to wait for the for the branches to, to grow. grow yeah and and you're not in a hurry which is beautiful I mean that's part of that's part of healing part of the journey and part of evolving there's no hurry yeah and I think when I was younger I had like huge ambitions and I wanted to win the Turner Prize and I wanted to be interviewed by Melvin Bragg and it was just like I think it was because when I was at art college it was the whole emergence of the YBA so you had Sarah Lucas and Tracy Emin and it was um, um, Gillian Waring and Sam Taylor Wood and they were just these like really powerful female artists um, and I wanted a part of that but now I don't in any way shape or form yeah. um, I'm I might exhibit my work next year um, but I'm just I'm enjoying I'm enjoying the journey and if I'm just feeling it's so m much more enriching when you're not thinking about an exhibition date or that's got to be finished or when you're just letting things evolve slowly I mean, there can be other things that come out of that, but the core of my my practice is still very much in its infancy because I think it is because I've revisited that maiden, so it's like I'm sort of going back to that that part, the the spring of my of my art practice. Abby, it makes me then understand uh, why being a creative guide and working with people to help them overcome the fear of the blank page is uh, so important to you. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's, um, yeah, it's the confidence. And I speak to so many women who wish that they could have gone to art college and they didn't because they took an academic path. Um, it's, they, they can feel this void that, they didn't fulfill this desire and I was talking to I did a medicine circle recently um and you do a, a visualization and you think about yourself standing in the center of all the seasons so it's the seasons of your life the seasons of your days um and of the year and you turn around and look into these different seasons um and I think that so many people now want to want to visit that, want to go back to that, but they don't know how to. They think we've got all these narratives and all these stories. It's too late for me. Oh, I should have done that years ago. Oh, I can't possibly do that that now. I'm too old to do that. And it's like we're never too old. We're never we're, because all the answers are already inside us. We know that if there's that intuition, that deep, deep desire to do something. You know, life is so, I think, losing so many people and um, they were all creative people, but they never fully stepped into it because of these narratives. I mean, my grandmother, her, her parents, very incredibly Victorian, um, but we're still hanging on to those Victorian beliefs and the beliefs of who we should be in the world. And so it's it's helping people find that confidence within that this is okay. And I think it's having, um, in my words, they've escaped me having. It's having the strength. I, I feel like a yeah, permission, permission slip. Yeah. To have a permission slip. Yeah. 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 Because you, a lot of people haven't got anyone in their lives who would give them that permission slip. Oh, you don't want to, Oh, you don't want to be an artist oh no what, what are you doing that for and it's and I think that's why I've really pulled myself away from the commerciality of it because it's like oh how are you going to make money 
how are you going to sell that? Where are you going to sell that? Oh, you're going to do this show. And this, if you start doing that at the beginning of your journey, then, well, I personally think it's over because you're, you're just throwing it, you're throwing it all out into the ether. Yeah. And you need to learn from it. Yeah. Yeah. And you're doing it for the wrong reason. So, Abby, um, could you tell us a little bit about how your mentorship and your, uh, you, how your program works? So, um, I do offer like an hour, an hour and a half one-off session, which no one's ever done. <laughs> they have, but they've always put, we've always then booked in a few more. So, but then there's been some people have taken a gap between that. So, um, some people work with me over three months so we maybe have six sessions some people have a longer gap between um and it's different things from finding finding that new path that they want to go on like where do they where do they begin um to sharing with me their fears about their practice um I've worked with people who've been through art college, who've done masters and they still haven't got the confidence to show up as an artist because we're not taught that in art school, especially not in the, in the UK. Um, so it's a, it's helping people and guiding people to find a way back to their practice. And I think that's where a lot of my offerings come in. Like the, I do a 30 day, um, art journaling journey so it's the, the basis is to just show up for 15 minutes a day and it's just having a space and so many people haven't got an art studio and you think oh, I haven't got an art studio so I can't do it but even just a tray with some supplies on it a tiny corner of a kitchen table somewhere that you can go before the world wakes up or last thing at night or just some check-in so yeah. it's yeah, guiding people on how how they can weave it into their their life, whether they've got all the time in the world or they're super busy. Um, but it's very it's very much an individual program. Yeah. So I have a, a call with somebody and then we work out what they need and how that can fit into their life. And it might it might just be a one off conversation and they come back to me yeah. a year later or and um, Abby, you you also um, your workshops. You've got a you, you mentioned to me you've got a thirty day art journaling workshop which is starting on the first of September, and then you've got an art journaling course which starts on the twenty third of September. Um, so I'm assuming people can head to your website to uh, have a look and sign up for that if they're interested. Yeah. So the thirty day journey I've been doing now. Um, so it's every thirty days at quarter points of the year. Yes. So it's just showing up intensively every single day for those 30 days. But then you have this time either side of it to then work on what you've done in those those art journals. So we do it through each of the solstices and equinoxes. So this one will take us through the autumn equinox. Um, and I'm cre I will be creating one so that wherever you are in the world, you can start where you are in your season. And then the... The course um, I created in 2020 and then that's been added to and grown on and then that's going to be relaunching just before the autumn equinox. Wonderful. Before we uh, talk about the moon's phases, I want to show you some of the lovely comments that are coming through on the live, Abby. Oh. I think will really make uh, this is from Lorna Crane who's the most fabulous oh, artist yeah. I'm sure you know Lorna those photos are wonderful and have a delightful essence of place that's lovely thank you Lorna um Eva thank you Eva that's beautiful and then from Vicky there is hope for me I can't sell my work either but I have to make it I know exactly how you feel Vicky just let's yeah. keep making I agree with you on that <laughs> like that. we all love Wilbur Do, uh, I think it's the trust trust your own what well, I say trust your own path nature knows the way and so do you 
So if you trust your own path and just follow nature, nature doesn't all bloom at once. And that that seed that's a an annual, it might not be that. It might be something that needs to live underground for a few years and then just trust that something will something will eventually bloom from that if you keep nurturing it and keep tending to it. Yeah, that's true. And this is a great one from Eva. We're never too old. Well said. No. Yeah. And Lorna, it's never too late. You're so right, yeah. Lorna. Yeah. <laughs> and um, this is a lovely message from Melinda. Oh, beautiful. Um, I was feeling so guilty and discouraged as I wasn't selling my work that I had stopped creating. Now I want to continue on my journey. Oh. Yeah. Beautiful. Oh, that's lovely. Oh, thank you. There's some really beautiful comments. Abby, you've certainly touched a lot of people tonight. What a wonderful mentor. I have to save pennies and get that permission. <laughs> that's lovely. Um, Abby, I'd love to touch on the moon and um, the moon cycles. Uh, I, before, I, before I start, I must mention to everybody that in that beautiful introduction, some of those words which, you, which were yours, um, in this pursuit we often turn to various sources of guidance and inspiration, and one such source often overlooked but deeply connected to the natural rhythms of life is the moon cyclical phases. Your words are so beautiful, really, really are. Um, Thank you. Um, I think uh, if you could just talk people through how that how that phase works, what your plan with it is, it's very it's very intriguing for someone like myself who literally is hearing about it for the first time from you. Oh wow! Um, so it started with the slowing down and living more intentionally, and the whole slow living. Um, ethos which I did lots of research into then I moved into minimalism and decluttering and Maria Kondo and then it's like it just there's all these different layers that I keep putting on top then I started looking at the moon phases and it's taken me a couple of years to really to weave that in to reject it was a rejection of and maybe this was about four or five years ago the whole January new intention, you know, setting everything up in January and then feeling awful by the end of January because all those resolutions have been forgotten about. And it was just re-looking at, re at the whole year in a completely different way. So I would follow the wheel of the year, the Celtic wheel of the year. So we, the year begins... Um, for us here sort of autumn so it's like that you're gathering all of your seeds and harvesting and then preparing for the winter and then so going through all those things um and looking at looking at the whole year completely differently in terms of cycles and then the moon cycle comes in and then our own menstrual cycles comes in and then I've done um, lots of reading around how women's menstrual cycles would sync up with the moon and you had your cycle on the new moon or on the full moon. And it just made so much sense because our hormones, whether we're menstruating or not, go in cycles. We have fluctuating a cycle throughout the whole day. Um, so connecting that time of the moon and now that I've lost my cycle through perimenopause I was there was a grief there as well because I wanted to be now that I'd sort of started learning all about this cyclical living that there's a time in your menstrual cycle when you're menstruating to have time for reflection and then your energy increasing and I was like oh, I wish I'd known this like in my 20s but then connecting it to the moon I can have all those phases and they might not be connected to how my my hormone levels are but it's a grounding and it's something it's constant and you know that there's always going to be a new moon and there's always going to be a full moon and then the cycle begins again and then what I've tried to do over the last few months is weave that into my art practice I touch on it um, slightly in the 30-day journey and in my 
um, art journaling prompt cards. There's prompt cards for the new moon and the full moon. But now it's um, I'm going into it a little bit deeper of things that we can do in our art practice. There's just a time to pause really at those four points. There's eight phases of the moon, um, but I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible for myself and and for others that at weekly points there's things that we can do to overcome creative blocks at the moment with the moon waxing and increasing at the full moon having a little bit of a celebration of what we've done in our practice over the last few weeks at the new moon taking time to set some intentions what do I want to accomplish I do it um for, I used to do it as well for seasons. So it's like, well, what would I love to, what would I love to be able to see in my studio by the end of spring? How do I want to feel as we move into um, spring and go through the equinox? But sometimes that can be a bit much and a bit overwhelming, and that list becomes too big. So doing it on this smaller moon cycle you can then see it as a bigger picture but it's really beautiful to just take even if it's just five or ten minutes once a week to just connect with that phase because we can't I don't see how we can ignore that the moon can't affect us it's yes. been there it's been there since the beginning of time and it's like that's how we've evolved and we used we must be the same as animals that they behave differently in the full moon and new moon and I think for me being out in the countryside and being able to see it as well, I think when you can't see it, that's, that's really, it's really difficult to find that connection. Mm -hmm. But now you've got um, NASA's website is incredible um, to see the moon phases and there's wonderful apps as well that you can have on your phone. Um, and I think it's something that you've just got to gently, gently think about to maybe weave in and it might not work for you it might not work for you but even if you just took it as a time to pause and reflect I think you're right I think the the idea of um acknowledging it is the first step and then by by acknowledging it you're thinking about it you're aware of it you'll mm -hmm. start understanding what it's doing to you the fact that you're bringing it into a creative approach uh is, is incredible and uh, yeah I think it's incredible I mean you're right we have heightened energy at certain times of the month and how is that translating into our creativity what are we doing with that energy you know are we going for a run or are we going into the studio so mm -hmm. uh, it's it's a great first step is to actually acknowledge it and then take it from there and I like your approach to rather not have it overwhelm you but start with this the small cycles first because I was also there was a lot of um in a critic coming up that it's like well, why can't I have the energy that I had last week and I was in flow and I was making all this work and then it's like well yesterday I didn't want the day to end and I just wanted it to continue and continue because I was in this like piece of work that I never wanted to leave but today I just want to be outside and it was really healing to think about it well actually that's because the new moon's approaching and you need to take a little bit of time step away from your practice because like the whole trust the process again because when you come back to it that energy was there for that day and that's fine and I think it's um it's for me just taking yourself outside of yourself outside of your your inner critic your maybe negative thoughts and interrupting that negative thinking pattern to think mm, maybe there's something bigger going on because of the universe and, and it's not yourself, just me give yourself yeah. permission to give yourself a break yeah and then yeah. now understanding that I can harness that a bit more that when I'm in that flow and just go okay this is great just enjoy it for the moment rather than going oh I don't want the day to end and and then when I need that quiet time that's when I do a lot of my writing um so yeah just putting my headphones in and just typing or writing on paper and having that that balance I think is really lovely as well yeah yeah wow um 
you've certainly given us lots to think about, Abby. I think uh, there'll be a lot of people thinking about that this evening. Thank you. Um, Abby, as we wrap up, we've been going an hour now, so I feel like, um, <laughs> how are you going? Good? It doesn't feel like an hour at all. <laughs> we said you'd have fun. Yeah. Um, do you have any final messages or advice for any fellow artists that are particularly seeking to embrace the intuitive side of their creativity? Um, I feel I feel like um, you've got so much to say and you've got some some really big big uh, advice for people. Um, I guess yeah. Do you have anything that you'd like to offer as a final bit of advice for anybody? Yeah, I think. If you're not feeling, if you're not getting those gut feelings or knowing what direction that you need to go in, it's about finding finding a place where you can hear those those whispers. Because um, sometimes it is just a feeling, but you can't actually hear what it is. And that might be out walking in nature. It might be listening to music that you haven't listened to for years it might be um a time when you're on your own or just giving yourself I think giving yourself some space to try and listen listen to what is your real truth rather than all of the voices that are in our heads and calling them out as well like, well actually where's that story coming from is that my truth or is that somebody else's truth that's being project, projected onto me? Um, and that's where, yeah, that's where I found my voice. It's like, I know you, I want, I've wanted to be an artist for decades and decades and decades. So why am I not showing up every day as that artist and just, yeah, putting those shoes on and seeing how they feel for a bit? And it might not be, you might feel it's not right, but I think being an artist is not about selling your work and being successful, commercially successful. Um, there's an artist, Felida Barlow, who died recently. She was at the Venice Biennale um, representing the UK. But she says in an interview, um, why not all work has to be seen and how much work she made over her lifetime that was never seen by anybody. But it was part of her journey and enriched her process so much. And I think it's, yeah, just trusting that. And it's as soon as you hear somebody else saying that, it's like, oh, okay, that's okay. And I think, yeah, maybe in this digital world and social media, we've been sold this narrative that we have to be exhibiting and selling having sellout launches sellout collections every piece with red stickers on it and that's not that's not the journey of an artist in its truth oh that's lovely abby thank you so much for sharing that with us well abby i must say thank you so much it has been an absolute pleasure chatting with you and getting to know you and talking about your process it's been really really wonderful thank you so oh, much thank you um i hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have I have, I have. Thank you. Will you stay on the line and we'll have a little yes. private? Thanks, Abby. Thank, Thank you. you.